good to be with you today. Come on, we've come to celebrate the salvation we have in Jesus. He's changed us, He's saved us. Thank you, God. I was lost in shame, could not get past my blame until He called my name. I'm so glad He changed me. Darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me. faith. 
of gratitude for your salvation, for your faithfulness, and we turn our hearts to you. Lord, give us a heart of worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. Longing just to breathe something that's the word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. Thank you. You search much deeper within through the way. Things of
Amen. Go ahead and have a seat for just a few moments, if you would, and welcome to worship this morning. And, and uh, if you're watching on, online or on television, welcome as well. And go ahead and get your Bible, get your Bible ready here. And we're going to sing another song after we pray together. But, but today we're going to begin talking about the subject of forever hope in a whatever world. And we're gonna be going straight to God's word. We're gonna be looking at a, at, a, at a fairly short book of the Bible towards the end of the Bible in the New Testament called 1 Peter. And 1 Peter's written by the apostle Peter, one of the 12 disciples that walked with Jesus, but he sends it to believers during a time when, well, it wasn't easy to be a follower of Christ, y'all. It was in a world where there was a lot of travail, there was hardship, there were reasons to be worried, reasons to be anxious. Even though it was written during a time when Rome was the superpower and these are believers in the Roman Empire, so you would think that everything would be all all situated and everything would be fine, right? But, But one, it was a tough time to be a Christian. It was a tough time to be someone who said, I'm gonna try to, Lead my life according to this book right here. But also they were just dealing with the normal things that you and I face and the things that you and I might experience. Maybe they had a sick loved one. Maybe, Maybe they were struggling with some crisis in their own life. Well, loved ones, that's why we turn to God's word. Because in the scriptures, we find that we have all the reason in the world to have hope. It's because Jesus Christ, the one you were just singing about, the the reason we're here today for worship, the reason that we can rest assured that our prayers are heard and answered is because Jesus is our hope. Are you thinking about that this morning? Is Jesus your hope this morning? I want you to do something that back during Peter's day was something that was a very simple thing they would say. And sometimes they would even, they would even write it in the ground because maybe they were in a place where they were kind of nervous about saying it out loud, afraid that maybe somebody would, you know, jump them or they'd get in trouble or they'd get arrested or something. But, but it was a very simple saying, and it, but it makes all the difference in the world. And they would just say, Jesus is Lord. And you might say, well, Brian, that sounds kind of trite. That sounds kind of simple this morning. You got anything deeper for us than that? Anything a little bit more that we haven't heard before? But think about that for a minute. Jesus is Lord. Because if that's true, if Jesus is the master, if Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that means he's in charge. That means whatever concerns you, whatever worries you, you can bring it to him today. You can trust that he's in charge, that he's in control. But see, we wrestle with that. We wrestle with really leaning into that subject. So do you believe that? So I want to just, I want to just invite you to just just to unite your heart with all those folks who followed Christ in ages past and just simply say those three words with me. Jesus is Lord, because that makes all the difference in the world. He's the reason we have hope, y'all, he really is. Now this morning before I pray with us, I, I give thanks, one, I wanna thank this church and so many others because this weekend I've spent part of the weekend, my wife and I, with 100 pastors and their wives. We invited them to, because of your giving, your support with Southern Baptists, we were able to host 100 pastors and their wives in Williamsburg this weekend to encourage them, for them to know they're not alone in the ministry they're doing. And you might be a pastor and wife who are watching this worship service later in the week today because you're at church right now yourself. Or you might be watching this or you, or you, put, you tune into Grove because you've done it for years, and, but you go to another church in this community. So what, what I wanted you just to know is this, is be praying for your pastor. Pray for his wife. In this church, you'd be praying for those who are leading in ministry. I'm not too bashful and I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not too shy to ask you, pray for, pray for Jennifer and me, pray for us. The apostle Paul, by the way, 
he was always asking Chad people to pray for him. He really was. I was going to ask you to do that today, but I actually now have a second prayer request that really, really gripped my heart because of what we saw happen yesterday. And, and I don't know how, how long this is going to go on, but it's what's happening overseas where the Bible was written. It's taking place in Israel. It's taking place in the Gaza Strip. It's because of what was unleashed on Israel yesterday. I'm just reminded of this verse from Psalm 122, verse six. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Loved ones, there's, been a, there's, a, there's a conflict that's been going on for the ages and it, and, it, and, it, and it really, really escalated yesterday. Unless you've just been binge watching Netflix for the past 48 hours, you probably know what I'm talking about, all right? And that's because of Israel's own prime minister says, we're, we're now at war. And, and this conflict between the Arabs and Muslims and the Jews, it's been going on well for centuries, right? I heard a lady on the news last night, one of the, one of the broadcasters, she said, she said, this has been going on for the 26 years I've been covering the Middle East. It's been going on a lot longer than 26 years. We all know that, right? So I'm struck by this, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So loved ones today, here's, here's what we know the answer is. This is the only one who ultimately brings lasting peace. It's not gonna be a prime minister. It's not gonna be a general. It's not gonna even be a president. It's not gonna be the United Nations. The one who will bring ultimately lasting peace, because you see, ultimately peace between nations is only as good as the peace between men and women, and that's only as good as the peace that's in someone's heart. And Jesus, our Lord, he's the one that brings peace. He's the hope of Jerusalem. He's the hope that the, that, that he's the hope, he's the, he's the Messiah, he's the one who was sent for his chosen people, Israel. He's also, he's the hope for the Palestinians and the Arabs. Loved ones, listen to this. I got word late last night from some missionary friends overseas. They were just asking for prayer. And they're minister, they minister to both. Loved ones, we know how this story ends. We know what the Bible tells us, that the day will come when people will lay down their weapons because loved ones, we know who really reigns. There are people waking up, there are people in this world right now, they're, they're desperately wondering who's really in charge. So whatever is the issue where you are right now, maybe it's much closer to home to you and your life this morning, your need for hope, than what's taking place on the news or in the Middle East. But loved ones, I just wanna invite you to pray with me right now. So in this room, let's just unite our hearts in prayer. Just stand to your feet as we pray, if you would. Standing as we come before our Heavenly Father in all His majesty, He's now received, He receives our prayers. Just unite your hearts with us in prayer. Father, I pray right now. Father, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for those that are hurting and suffering, those that have been caught in harm's way. God, help them, I pray. Father, I pray that you would bring peace to that land. I pray that people would, would trust you, Jesus, in that land and that you, Lord Jesus Christ, the only hope for this world, oh, Lord Jesus, I pray people would receive you. God, I thank you for pastors and their wives who I was able to see this weekend, but Father, I pray for their ministries right now. I pray for the ministry of this church and for other churches in this community. God, I pray that you will use us as beacons of hope and light in this community. So Father, today, whatever needs we have, may we know that Jesus, you are the name above all names, that there's power in your name, Lord Jesus, that your blood has paid for our sins, that Lord Jesus, you're the, you are the redeemer. You are the one who reigns. You are the answer to our prayers. You are the one who gives us hope because Lord Jesus, there in Jerusalem, there's an empty tomb and that empty tomb preaches to us every day that there's hope. So Lord Jesus, I pray that 
as we build our lives, as we build our families, I pray that we, Lord Jesus, would know that you're the firm foundation. You're the one we must lean upon and build our lives upon. So Father, I pray whether we're in this room or whether we're watching right now, I pray that each and every one of us would just ask you right now, Father, to prepare our hearts to receive your word. That we would each and every one of us let you examine our hearts and Holy Spirit fill us, I pray, so that we might know that the only way to really build the life that you want for us is it has to start with you, Lord Jesus. So God, be worshiped, not just in this place, but Lord, be worshiped in our lives. Lord Jesus, you're the name above all names. Jesus is Lord. Would you say that again? Jesus is Lord. In Christ's name we ask it. Sing this song together, all right? Let's praise his name.
know that you are the Messiah. You have come to save them, Lord. Let them accept you today. My bad. That was my fault. Um, just want everybody to know I am, I'm, uh, I'm a highly trained professional, so don't try this at home, okay? Um, anyways, hey, take your Bibles, find First Peter chapter 1. They're like, just don't touch that switch, okay? We'll be all right. First Peter chapter 1. Today I want to talk to you, as I said, about hope. I came across this. It's been said we can live a month without food five days without water, five minutes without air, but we can't live a second without hope. Can't live without hope. You know, humans seek after hope like a moth seeks after light. <laughs> you ever notice that, man? I tell you, turn on your light outside, outside your door, and it's nighttime, man, that moth wants to try to get in the house so fast. It's intrinsic to who we are. I came across this neuroscientist, Tally Sherratt, argues hope is so essential to our survival that it's hardwired in our brains, arguing it can be the difference between living a healthier life versus one trapped by despair. Studies show that hopeful college students get higher GPAs um, and more likely to graduate than those who are despondent or those who are discouraged. Hopeful athletes perform better on the field, cope better with injuries, and have greater mental adjustment when situations change on the ball field. In one study of the elderly, those who said they felt hopeless were more than twice as likely to die during the study follow-up period than those who were more hopeful. You know, having hope is important. It's, it's, it's pretty clear, hope is a powerful catalytic. And, and Dr. Shane Lopez, the psychologist who was regarded as the world's leading researcher on hope, claimed that hope isn't just an emotion, but it's an essential life tool. That's why, that's why I want you to see that, listen, you don't, you don't have to call the psychologist, you don't have to be the world's greatest athlete, 
You don't have to be a star student to know you can have hope because there's a living hope. Take your Bible and look with me at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Here's what God's word says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. Say that again with me. Jesus is Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And here it is, to a living hope. Everybody say hope. Hope. To not just any kind of hope, but to a living hope living hope, and here's why, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, the reason we have hope, the reason today you and I can have hope, the reason we can look at whatever may face us in this life is because Jesus Christ is the living, risen Lord and Savior. It's because indeed there is that empty tomb on the other side of the world that cries out to us, Jesus is the hope. Jesus is Lord. Jesus gives hope. So let's just take a moment and, and, and just bow with me in prayer. And, and I just want to pray this. Father, I pray right now that you would help each and every one of us to know, Lord Jesus, that you're our living hope. Father, I pray the words in my mouth, the meditation in my heart will be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord God, you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus is the living hope. That's what I'm talking about, having a forever hope in a whatever world. Because we just don't know exactly what the news is going to tell us today. We just don't know what kind of phone call or text message or email we might get today. But you need to know this. Whatever comes our way, we've got to keep encouraging each other in this. Jesus Christ is our living hope. Amen? So let me just give you four reasons today of why you can have forever hope in a whatever world. Here's number one. We are God's people. We're God's people and we're part of his victorious kingdom. Look with me at verse one of chapter one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He's naming cities there. He's naming towns and villages where these different believers were living. And he tells them who he is. He says, listen, I'm Peter. I was an apostle of Jesus Christ. But then, but then look at how he addresses them. He refers to them as exiles. And it says of the dispersion. What had happened is because of persecution there in the Roman Empire, many of the Jewish folks, even Messianic Jews, many of the Jewish believers, they had dispersed. That's what dispersion means. It means they had dispersed. They were now living all over in different places of the Roman Empire. But when he calls them, he doesn't say to those who are followers of Christ. He doesn't say to those who, who are Christians. He calls them elect exiles. Maybe your translation of the Bible says strangers. It might say aliens or pilgrims. What he was telling them was this church, and this is good for us to get. He was saying, listen, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your whatever world right now, you are temporary residents. This world is not going to be your ultimate permanent home. This isn't where your ultimate citizenship is. Now I have, a, I have a United States passport and it says I'm a citizen of the United States and I am, I'm thankful for that, I'm proud of that and, and it has served me well. But I have to remember, and you need to remember this today too, listen, ultimately as a follower of Christ, your citizenship, your citizenship is in his kingdom. Your citizenship is in heaven. You are really like an exile. You're really like a stranger. You're really like a pilgrim who is just in this world, this whatever world, for just this time. And then look at what he says. He says, he calls them elect exiles. He says, you're elect exiles. Here's what he wants them to know. Listen, you're not in this world. You're not even a follower of Christ by accident. God is not, listen, he is not, he is not some absentee God or father figure who created this world and set it spinning and then just left the building. That's not God. That's not, that's not our almighty God. He says, I want you to know this, listen, listen. You're not some chance in the cosmos. You're not some accident. 
The New Living Translation, the Christian Standard Bible says, we have been chosen. Listen, you're not, you're not thrown on this earth like someone tossing dice on a game board, all right? That's not your situation. I need to know this, listen, God in all his sovereignty and his providence, listen, he has chosen me. You can be encouraged by that. You can be encouraged that you are secure in his hands. Ephesians chapter one, verse four says, long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us. God loved you, he loved me. The Bible tells us God so loved this world. Loved ones, don't miss that. Maybe this is your first day at church, and I tell you what, if this is your first day at church, that, that statement that God loves you might actually surprise you a little bit. Because you understand there are people in this world, there are even, there are even most, quite, quite a few, most of the major world religions actually view, oh, they view God as almighty. They view God as great. They don't ultimately view God as being a God of grace, love, and mercy. Loved ones, you need to know that God in his greatness, God in his justice, God has shown you and me his love. The Bible says God demonstrated his love towards us that while, you, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, you see, you've been chosen. Not only have you been chosen, but the Bible tells us you're being sanctified. Look at verse two. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied. Oh, you see, not only, not only has God chosen, chosen, not only you, God's people, listen, he is at work sanctifying you. You see, to be sanctified means that you've been set apart for a godly task. Every single one of us, every single one of you as a follower of Jesus Christ, you understand that God has a task for you. God has called you to be a part of his service. God has called you to be a part of making him known in this world to your neighbors and the nations. Don't miss that. You see, we're sanctified by the work of his Holy Spirit and God wants to work in your life and my life so that we actually walk in that sanctification. He's making us, he's at work in our lives day in and day out, leading and working in our lives so that we can walk in obedience to God himself. Loved ones, don't miss, we are God's people. We're part of his victorious kingdom. This is what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He said, but we ought to always give thanks to God for you brothers beloved by the Lord because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may attain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not an accident that you're here this morning. It's not an accident that you're hearing God's word. You you need to know God has called you. You've put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark it down. You are part of his family. We are God's people. We're part of his victorious kingdom, chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, and sanctified by the Spirit. Amen? Amen. I've heard that um, when Harvard University is getting killed on the football field and it's college football season. When Harvard University is getting killed on the football field and the opposing fans start to gloat that the Harvard student body has developed a cheer that helps keep everything in perspective. When the opposing fans revel in another touchdown against Harvard, the scholarly Harvard students supposedly start chanting, quote, that's all right, that's okay, you're gonna work for us someday. <laughs> listen, listen to me, listen to me. They're, there is a perspective you and I need to have. And sometimes it may be when you go to school, it may be when you go to work, it may be that you feel discouraged or despondent or beaten down, but you need to know this, listen, there is victory in the Lord Jesus. You're a part of his victorious kingdom and don't ever miss that. It doesn't mean that there's not gonna be suffering, it doesn't mean that there's not gonna be hardship, but you need to know that you've been chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, and you're being sanctified by the Spirit. You know, when Satan seems to be gaining the victory and you're tempted to get discouraged, just remember this, that's all right, that's okay, every knee will bow someday, amen? 
We've been chosen by God to be part of his victorious kingdom. That's number one. But let me give you a second reason. We've been born again and you are guaranteed eternal life in heaven. Look at verse three. The Bible says, blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And here it is, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It is kept secure. Now sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm a born again Christian. But honestly, that's redundant. Saying I'm a born again Christian, that's a little bit like saying wet water or hot heat. It's redundant, all right? You see, you see to be a Christian, you've gotta be born again. That's, that's what we're told in John chapter three. Remember Nick, Nicodemus, this religious leader, he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, how can I have eternal life? And Jesus, and this man, man, he fasted two days a week. He gave alms to the poor. He had memorized much of the first five books of the Old Testament. He'd attended synagogue religiously, yet Jesus told Nick, he said this, he says, something's missing, Nick. And in John chapter three, the Bible says, unless a man is born of water, Jesus said in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, Nicodemus, you've gotta be born again. So here's my question for you. Have you been born again? Have you surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, repented of your sins, gotten off your throne, and said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins, that you, that you were buried in that tomb and you've come back to life. Jesus Christ, I confess you as my Lord. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess Jesus as your Lord, believe with all your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Loved ones, that's, that's the question of life. Have you been born again? And I just wanna to say to you in this room, listen, if, if, if you're not sure you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't leave, don't leave this place today without talking to someone, without talking, come and talk to me, say, 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 Brian, I need to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Loved ones, you're watching on, on, online or on TV right now, you reach out to us. We, we wanna be able to share with you how you can be born again in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a reason to have hope, amen? We've been born again, but then get this, you're guaranteed eternal life when you're born again. You're guaranteed eternal life, don't miss that. Your place in heaven is reserved for you. Jesus tells us that. In John 14, he said, don't let your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And loved ones, he goes on to say, no one could come to the Father except through me. That's why I was telling you earlier, Jesus is the hope of peace. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. Oh, you've gotta be born again and then you're guaranteed eternal life. I came across this little story about, about, a, about a first grade Sunday school class. And the, and the teacher asked this group of six-year-olds if they would explain to her what someone had to do in order to go to heaven. And, um, and so to kind of get the conversation going to try to help the kids out, she said, well, if I sold my house and my car and I had a big garage sale and I gave all the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And the, and the children answered, no. If I cleaned the church every day and I mowed the yard at the church and I kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? And what did the six-year-old say? No. If I was kind to animals and gave candy to all the children and loved, and, and loved my husband, would that get me into heaven? And again, they all shouted what? No. Well, then the teacher asked, looking out kind of over the class, how can I get into heaven? And a boy on the back row said, you gotta be dead. <laughs> well, that's true, that's true. You, you, you're gonna have to be dead to, to go to heaven. But loved ones, you gotta be born again. You got to be born again. Have you put your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, for you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. There's a saying that goes like this, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. You know, do you have hope today? Here's another reason for you. Look down with me at verse five. It says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, you see, yes, it's true that we're God's people and have a part in his victorious kingdom. It's true that if you've been born again, you're guaranteed eternal life in heaven. But here's a third reason to have hope. We're shielded by God's power. And don't miss this. We're shielded by God's power and can be thankful that suffering is temporary because the truth of the matter is, as you can say, Brian, that all sounds well and good, but, but what about the suffering? What about the suffering I'm going through right here, right now? He says, he says, listen, you're gonna be guarded by God's power. Now, the reality is this. You, you and I know that we're not shielded from all the suffering that's out there, but God does indeed shield you probably in more ways than you could ever imagine. I remember this conversation that took place in the Bible because one morning early I got up this week and I just said, I was just in my Bible reading and, and I sat down and, and I read through the book of Job in the Old Testament. Some think it's the oldest book of the Bible and it's, it's not a short book. Uh, and I read through it and I'm a relatively fast reader and I was reading through it and honestly, if you've never read the book of Job, you, you, you may not really realize, but Job, Job is a book of suffering, man. Now, some of you have read the book of Job, so now you know why I'm getting ready to say what I'm getting ready to say. There was parts of Job, man, I'll be honest with you, I was reading it fast. I'm like, man, I need to get to the next page because this is just, this is so sad. This is so discouraging. I gotta get to the next, I gotta get to the end of the story. And in, and in Job's life, Satan actually, actually comes to God and he questions Job's integrity and he really questions Job's love for God. And so within certain boundaries, yes, God actually permits the evil one to wreak some havoc in Job's life. And some people wrestle with that. They wrestle with bad things happening. I won't say to good people, they wrestle with bad things happening to godly people. Now I don't know what would, I don't know, I don't know why some, some people really wrestle with God's sovereignty here with this and God's power. But if I were to say, well, that was beyond God's control, that suffering, friend, I'm gonna tell you something, that doesn't, that doesn't help me at all. That doesn't bring me any comfort. And you might say, well then, Brian, how does it bring you any comfort that if God is all powerful and God's almighty, that Job, that he let Job suffer? Well, by the way, I'll tell you, sometimes there's suffering that on this side of heaven, you're not going to totally understand. You just won't. And what I tell you, what I, what I was reminded of this morning reading that book of Job is I was reminded that, it, that God, God, God can handle me asking him why. God can handle me asking him questions. God God can handle me crying out to him. And you know what God ends up telling Job? Job, Job, son, we gotta get one thing straight. I'm God, you're not. <laughs> Loved ones, you, you need to know this morning, oh, there's gonna be suffering that may come, but take comfort in this, that just like in Job's life, the suffering was temporary. And quite often, and even in this, you look at Job's suffering. Job suffered so much, but yet what happened? We've talked about Job for centuries. Why? Because he suffered. And I know, you listen, I've, I've had friends that after they've become followers of Christ, that's when they got cancer. But loved ones, I want you to know, there's been times where I have just been amazed at hearing testimonies, but isn't it true for you, just as it is for me, that when you hear someone who has suffered, 
and they've been through it, that when they still praise the Lord and they testify to his grace and mercy, isn't that really when you're in awe? So loved ones, you need to know this, you're shielded by God's power. Now, sometimes we don't always understand. You know, the Bible tells us, and this is another sermon for another day, the Bible tells us that God has purpose when there's suffering and God has a point to it. And the Bible teaches us that our suffering as Christians, it can prove our faith in God and it even purifies our faith in God. Warren Wiersbe says it like this, when you're in the furnace, God keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the clock. Because you see, sometimes we're, we're in that furnace of suffering and God is using that to purify our faith just like the refiner purifies silver and gold in the refiner's fire. Oh, oh, you may go through suffering, but you need to know, you need to know by his grace and his power, it is temporary, and ultimately, ultimately, he takes us, he takes us home to heaven. But then fourth, they just get this and I'm done. Number four is this, we have knowledge of the gospel and understand God's overall plan. Look down at verse 10. The Bible says, concerning this salvation and the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully. All throughout the Old Testament, these prophets are writing prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. And they must have wondered how exactly it was gonna turn out and how it was gonna come about. Verse 11 says, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories, by the way, by the way, Jesus Christ is no stranger to suffering. The one we look to for hope, he suffered. He suffered at the hands of injustice. He suffered and he bled. Loved ones, he took on our suffering. Verse 12 says, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who, here it is, preached or proclaimed the gospel, the good news to you. He's writing to these Christians. He's saying, you've heard what Jesus has done for you, that Jesus came and he gave his life for you and that he provides for you eternal life. And then he, say, he says this, he says, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and then, then that last little phrase of verse 12, things into which angels long to look. You know what I've always thought is you know angels, angels, they, they know of God's greatness. They know of God's majesty. They've probably seen it much better than you and I have. But you know something that, you know something that angels just marvel at and wonder about what it must be? That is they marvel and they wonder at the gospel. They marvel and they wonder at God's grace and his mercy. And I've heard it put like this, that whenever the redeemed begin to sing songs like amazing grace, that the angels of heaven itself grow quiet and even, even, even get near the edge of heaven itself and they lean over yearning to know more about what is this thing called grace. Beloved ones, that's the song we sing. It's because Jesus Christ is the one who brings us hope. Jesus Christ, I go back to verse three, according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Oh, loved ones, I don't know where you may be today, but I wanna, I don't know what you might be looking at in your life but I wanna, I wanna encourage you to do this. Today, you need to look at that empty tomb. You need, you need to know that empty tomb cries out to you and me that Jesus Christ is the living hope. That's what gives you and I forever hope in this whatever world. I wanna ask you to stand to your feet and just bow your heads with me in prayer. And right now, right now, right where you are, I want to ask you, what, what are you leaning on for hope? Who are you looking to for hope? I'm reminded of, of, of a story about, about he was a very, he was, he was, he was very smart. He, 
He was a brilliant scientist in many ways. His name was Carl Sagan and he hosted for years on television a show called The Cosmos. He ended up dying of cancer, but he never came to faith in Christ, by the way. A few months before he died of bone cancer, he said this, I would love to believe that when I die, I'll live again. That some thinking, feeling, remember, remembering part of me will continue, but as much as I want to believe that, I know of nothing to suggest that that's more than just wishful thinking. And Carl Sagan has spent his life looking into outer space, pondering how the earth came into being and pondering if there might even be other forms of life out there. But yet Carl Sagan, when he breathed his last, he had no living hope. It reminds me of something that that first, uh, that first man, he was actually a Soviet cosmonaut, the first human being to, to, to go into outer space and circle the earth. He, he looked out and he commented, I have been to the heavens and I, and I did not see any God. Loved ones, you don't need to be looking into the emptiness of space today. My point is all you need to do is look at that empty tomb and know that Jesus is your living hope. Father, help each and every one of us today to know that Jesus, you're our living hope. Help us to know that we can turn to you and trust you and cry out to you. In Christ's name, amen. So think about that, that, that today, will you? Consider that. Let us know if we can pray with you about that. How we can help you know Jesus is hope. Now, loved ones, I'm gonna be down front. You may wanna come if you wanna come and kneel and pray. If I can pray with you, if today you wanna trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, you come. And for the rest of us, His name. Consider the one who gives us hope. Amen. Don't go home today without hope. When you get ready to walk out of this building in a few minutes, you, you leave here knowing that Jesus is the living hope. All right? Let's praise his name.
Tell you what, we, I want to ask for a few more minutes of your time. If you're a guest here with us today, um, if, if you need a jet, I, I get that, but we're going to do one item of business as a church, okay? And that's church is a real place, okay? Like I said, this isn't just a TV show, all right? But the other piece is you may want to hang around because got a few, a couple of exciting announcements for you. But Matt Cobb, come on up from our, from our church board. We've got uh, uh, one uh, item to vote on church. So be seated if you would for a few moments, and I'll be right back with some news and announcements. All right. I don't know if you picked up the good news there, but you don't have to hear any announcements from me this week. And I, I personally am happy about that. So, Brian, thank you. Um, for those of you who, who've been here the past few weeks, we, we put notice out on this that we're going to call a church meeting. We're voting on adding two members to the board of directors. Part of the reasons for this is because one of our board members, Chuck Ward, he and his wife are moving um, to North Carolina in the near future, so he needs to resign from the board, but we need to replace him. So last week you heard Rebecca Dillard and Tom Allender come up here and, and share their testimony. You've had a week to pray about them joining the board, to, to ask them any questions to, um, if you wanted to. So I'm gonna call a church meeting right now. And the way we're gonna do this, we're gonna take a vote on one at a time on each of them by show of hands. Um, and it's a majority vote to do so. So um, I'll call the church to a, a formal business meeting and We'll do ladies first. So um, if you are in favor of Rebecca Diller joining the board, please raise your hand. All right. Anyone opposed? All right. Congratulations, Rebecca. All right. Next up, we have Tom Allender. Um, if you're in favor of Tom joining the board, please raise your right hand. All right. Thank you. Anyone opposed? All right, Tom, congratulations. Looking forward to work with all of y'all. Thank you. And with that, I'll adjourn the business meeting, right. Brian. Thanks. Appreciate that. Well, that wasn't too painful. And, um, and Matt, you, you didn't too bad. Uh, we'll work on your announcing and all that. We're just teasing. <laughs> No, thank you for that, man. Appreciate y'all's hard work on that. And a uh, couple announcements. One is, um, as we're working on kind of building some ministry team and some pieces like that, you're gonna be hearing more and more in the next few weeks to come. Don't forget about Fall Festival. I may say that again before I go down the next few minutes. Don't forget about Fall Festival. Um, by the way, um, you may have got this in your text messages and all that. We do have a paper copy, some announcements out there on a table, Welcome Center. You may be wondering about how to sign up to help with Fall Festival or where to drop 
candy off and um, see, see folks at the welcome table. If you don't get an answer on that, email us on this piece of paper right here. And we've got these out on a table out there, I believe, if you didn't get one coming in. It has uh, three places you can email us if you have questions, because I certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. And um, um, so certainly you may want to ping us there on that. And if push comes to shove, you just email us at info, info at groveav.com. And we'll try to get that to the right person. Hey, this is a season of building for us and growing as a church and taking next steps. So we're just praying through and God is raising people up and getting people into certain roles. I just want again to ask for your patience with me as I get to know you, get to know what God's doing in the congregation. I'm trying to kind of learn who's doing what and who's doing where and all that type of stuff with the ministry of the church. But just with the way the fall festival folks have stepped up. Hey, look, folks, now's a good time. Be praying about where God might use you. Also, now's a great time in the fall. Don't be nervous about inviting someone to come to church. Sometimes when the church is going through transition, you'll be like, well, I don't know if it's a good time to invite or not because I want us to have everything perfect. Well, by the way, you're way, you're way doing that the wrong way because guess what? Most folks out there probably aren't expecting church to be perfect. They're just wondering why you never invited them to yours. All right. And, and by the way, we all know there is no perfect church, amen, all right? That doesn't exist, okay? I mean, and so that's, that's not even a goal for us. We do wanna be a church that's all about God's glory as best we can by his grace, believing that he's able to work in and through us. So don't, don't be bashful about reaching out. That's why run, one reason we're just gonna walk through this book of the Bible together. It's not just my words, because in the end, what I say really isn't what it's about. It's about pointing to God's word because the Bible tells us God, God's word endures forever. And that's where your friends, that's where your family, that's where your neighbors can find hope, all right? But an exciting development for us is the fact that we're working in some of our preschool and children's area. And Rachel, who's been working with our preschool, has had to also be kind of doing double duty with our elementary age children. And a, and a delightful lady has been a part of this fellowship, been volunteering, doing things here, even as part of the fall festival planning team. And the Lord has worked in her life for her to step into a role, helping us as coordinator with our children's ministry. Um, did a brief little intro video, video with her this week. I'd like y'all to watch that at least put name with face. So let's watch this. Grove Church family, I'm excited to introduce to you Robin DeRozier. She's going to be serving as our children's minister. Because I'm like, I was having a slow day. <laughs> um, it was just one of those moments. I had taken a Benadryl and that's what happened. Okay, no, I'm just saying, hey, that's okay. I was at a, doing a men's conference last week and I had, I thought, a great closing illustration and it totally, totally, the video didn't even work. So, hey, we'll get you introduced to Rob and we can post that probably on social media, guys, don't sweat it. I get how technology goes. Um, she, she, she might be relieved. She was like, do I have to do this on video? She is a delight. If you haven't met her yet, um, I hope you can. She, um, uh, I think, had a, a surgery late last week, so couldn't be here today. But be praying for Robin. She's gonna be helping us with our children's ministry. Um, had a wonderful testimony. I just uh, sad you couldn't couldn't see it a little bit. But anyway, um, but Rachel, I don't know if Rachel's made it in here from the preschool area or not. Is Rachel in here? I just wanted us to. Where's Rachel? Rachel, come up here for a moment. Hey, and that's what I want. Stand to your feet. We're just about done. Because I don't think Robin is here, is she? You didn't see Robin, did you? Rachel has been just continues to serve great with our preschool ministry, and you already started doing it, Rachel. Just a little bit I've been working with you. Thank you so much for what you're doing and what you're gonna to continue to do. But I know now you're gonna have some partnership and, and, and a co-laborer in that. But I wanted you all to show her and her family how much you love and support them and let them hear it in the preschool because a lot of times our family's serving back there. Rachel, thank you so much. You all show her how much you love and appreciate her. And I know you're anxious to get back there probably. Um, but uh, at least on your way back to the preschool, at least... Let's, some of y'all reach out and at least give our sister a high five, all right? I'll let you scoot, all right? Because I know she's like, I gotta get back there, all right? Thank you, Rachel, so very much. 
Well, listen, listen, thanks for hanging in there. I know uh, we went a little bit longer afternoon than, than maybe you were hoping for, um, but listen, listen, I'm gonna be at one of the doors, exits, look forward to seeing you, greeting you on the way out. Pastor Chad, you come on up, and if you would just send us off with prayer, I know we would so appreciate it. God bless you all. Um, we'll stay in touch, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next Lord's Day, if not sooner, okay? God bless you all so very much. Chad, you pray. Would you like me to pray? <laughs> yeah. let's, let's bring it. Father, we love you so much. We rejoice in the truth. It's not just our opinion. It's not just our take. We rejoice in the truth that you are alive and you are active and that you do love us. Not a single person in this room uh, watching online, on TV, none of us have to be afraid that you don't love us or maybe would turn us away. Lord, if, if we come to you with a broken and contrite heart, you would never turn us away. You love us. You died for all of us. And you, you want us. So, Lord, whether we've been abandoned, we've been forgotten, we feel like we've been forgotten, we don't feel loved, Lord, just touch each person's heart and just remind them that you do want them. You've never forgotten them. You, you died for them.